everyone, and welcome in to the Horse Racing Show. I'm Kenny Rice. Glad that you're with us again this week for episode number 51. Joe Talamo, talented jockey, will be joining us later on. And Lenny Rhodes, who is the CEO of a company that is sponsoring Breeders' Cup races and got involved for the first time. Which leads us to this. Is there anything out there in sports right now that doesn't have a corporate sponsorship? A few things still. The Super Bowl, World Series, uh, even though they have partner tie-ins to all of them. So probably there's nothing out there that doesn't have some type of corporate sponsorship. We'll talk about that and the importance of that to racing and to sports in general. Joined as always on lead guitar, Scott Hall on bass, Ben Chaffins, our researcher, Mr. Thomas Kenny. Gentlemen. Hello, Kenny. Hello. How you doing? Good, and you? Good New Year's yeah, and all that? That's right. Have any of you had to move? I know, I know one has. Have any of you had to move because of work to another location, maybe across town or across country or just to the neighboring state? Nope. Nope. Yeah, I did one time. I yeah. think Scott made a big move from Kentucky <laughs> make, to Los Angeles. Yeah. So quick, I had to have my belongings FedEx to me. <laughs> <laughs> that was, wasn't it? It was. I remember that. Yeah. Scott and I worked local TV together, and he That's got right. a job, and he was like in Hollywood. And yeah. I mean in Hollywood, not and, just. And my girlfriend, who is now my wife, uh, had to turn in my news van. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, it's a good thing you turned that in. You know, oh, know. interest would pile up on that. Oh, I'll tell you about it. And I bring that up because Joe Talamo's had to do this. He is an Eclipse Award winner. He's based primarily in Southern California, but he has made the move now to Arkansas. Eventually, he's going to be like in that Arkansas, Kentucky, Louisiana kind of area. And not only does he move, but his wife and his kids move too. And that's a situation with a lot of people out there in the horse racing business. You hear about all the superstars, the trainers and the jockeys and their home base. And they have maybe a barn area somewhere else. A trainer will come in and check it out and then go back to the home base. Or some jockeys will maybe go south for the winter and then come back up to New York or go, you know, wherever they're going and have that. But a lot of these guys, the majority of them, kind of pick and choose and see what's going well. If they're not getting as many mounts, things aren't going as well there. They simply move. They have to. And so Joe has kind of uprooted his family, and they have uh, settled down for the time being in Oaklawn Park. He'll be joining us when we come back in just a moment. So the rest of you all stay put. Don't move. Yeah. Yep. I'll be right here. We're holding. Okay. Please, don't you go anywhere. Stay with us. Eclipse Award-winning jockey Joe Talamo just picked up his 2,000th win. He'll be joining us next on the Horse Racing Show. Welcome back to the Horse Racing Show. I'm Kenny Rice. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, we continue to be downloaded in over 22 countries now, as well as around the U.S. A man who has been all over the place in a very successful career, just picked up his 2,000th win just a few days ago. Joe Talamo joins us now. Joe, one of the nice guys in the business, as well as the talented jockey. Welcome in. Oh, I appreciate you having me, Kenny. Thank you. Now, I was talking earlier about, you know, everybody has to move, or sometimes you have to make a move, maybe just across town or to the neighboring state with a job. In your case, you relocated the family. You've left uh, what had been home base for many years, Southern California. We talk to you now while you're just leaving Oakland Park in Arkansas, which is kind of the, the new home area, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, I, uh, I landed here yesterday morning. Uh, this morning was my my first day out here. And uh, I, I tell you, I, I, I got real excited when I was here, just walking around, seeing everybody. Um, I got to work, work a couple horses this morning, get over the track, felt really well, but it, it's, uh, it's exciting. I mean, I, I think change for, you know, anybody, uh, any athlete can be good. You see some guys going through different, different States. And, and uh, I, I think it's, I think it's going to be good. I really do. Now, when you talk to uh, your lovely wife, Elizabeth, I believe, correct? Yes, sir. How, how, how was she with the move with the boys and all? You know, because I think sometimes forget with any professional athlete, the, the wife and the kids are the ones that probably have to do most of the heavy lifting. Maybe oh, not absolutely. literally, but, you know. No, absolutely. No, she, she was actually great about it. We, uh, I, I think it was a couple months ago where we really sat down and had a good talk. And, I mean, she was she was 100% committed to it. And, and uh, I, I, to be honest, I don't. I don't think I could have made the move with, without her being so supportive. Because she, she's, uh, she's definitely made, made my life and riding career a lot better. Just from you, know, you know, from me letting to be able to do what I, what I do good, and her taking care of the kids so well. So that, that's made it, that's made it a lot easier. How's the boys handling the move so far? 
They, you know what? They're they're actually coming in four or five days. I got here just to kind of uh, set up shop, get every get everything all good. But uh, I, I love where we're at. We're actually right right on uh, Lake Hamilton, about 10, 15 minutes from the track. Um, and it, it's gorgeous. I, I mean, I absolutely love it here. What a, what a, uh, I haven't really gone around the town too much, but um, I went to the Kroger yesterday for the first time. So that, that's, about as far, that's about as far as I've gotten so far. Well, you know, that's important to learn now, learn where the grocery stores are and where the gas stations are. Very important as soon as you get to town. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know about the gas story. I ran out of gas actually the first mile after I got my car. I forgot to look down at the uh, gas tank there. But. <laughs> but see, that never happens on a horse. You know how much gas you got in the tank of the horses you rode, don't you? I mean, you don't get surprised too many times. Yeah, not too often. Not, I, I guess I'm a better jockey than car driver. That's a that's a good thing. <laughs> uh, talking with Joe Talamo, uh, he started out so hot. He has uh, maintained a solid career. You know, you win the Eclipse Award. You're the Apprentice of the Year. Uh, you're riding for one of the legends in the sport in Bobby Frankel, who encourages you to go to Southern California. And you know, you've handled success well. A lot of a lot of guys. We've seen a lot of people win the Eclipse Award as Apprentice. And then you kind of forget about their career nine, ten years later. But I believe you were still a teenager when you won that, Joe. Yeah, I was. Uh, so I started out when I was 16. Um, and then I rode through the fairgrounds when I was 17. And that's actually where, where I met and rode for uh, Bobby Franklin. And he wanted me to go to California literally for the weekend because I think uh, Gary Gomez at the time was riding everything for him. He had to go to Dubai. And I went there for three days. I think he put me on like six winners or something like that. And I, I, I fell in love with the weather. I pretty much just stayed there after that. I mean, it was absolutely gorgeous. That was back in 2007. How did you maintain it? Who, who was kind of there to help you so you would keep that even keel and not say, look at me, I'm so good. I've won an eclipse. I got Bobby Frankel in my corner. I'm winning grade one races. Who was kind of there to say, okay, Joe, uh, to maintain that, here's what you have to do. I, absolutely. I, I mean, there, there's so many people, but for sure, my agent, Scotty McClellan, um, who that, he, he uh, actually just retired from uh, when I came out here. But he so much of my success had to go to him because he, he's almost like me, very even keel. And he uh, he represented Chris McCarron for his whole pretty much his whole career. And Alex Solis. So, I mean, he, he was uh, I, I mean, he he had some of the best riders in, in history, obviously. So I, I was actually very fortunate to hook up with him and we were together about 13 years i believe uh till i just moved he, he much of that and and uh elizabeth as well i, I mean we, we started dating actually when i was 17 when i first got there and her being from a horse family uh her dad ron ellis obviously who's a big trainer out there and and uh her mother amy is paul mcgee's uh sister so yeah. she came from a racing family and she really understands the ups and downs i mean you're not gonna you're not going to win every week and uh you know you could have slumps and droughts and stuff like that so she she's definitely helped me handle ups and downs throughout my career and uh in my family as well my mother and father i mean i came from a really great household that taught me uh you're not going to get anything in life for free you have to work uh pretty much for whatever you want and uh and, and i'm proud to say that that i have you know nothing ever was given to me but i definitely had to work hard for it so really all of those people have, have really helped me you know, achieve what I have achieved and, and hopefully uh, much more. We're talking with Joe Talamo. He's one among others, Santa Anita Derby, Santa Anita Handicap, Wood Memorial, Breeders' Cuff Turf Sprint. And recently, uh, just a few weeks ago, you won your 2000th career race. What was that like to get that milestone? That, that was crazy. It's a funny thing. I never, uh, I, I try not to look at stats too much or numbers. I, I just try and go out there and whether I'm on a five claim or, or million dollar race just try and win it you know and uh and my agent scotty at the time said man you know you're only uh seven away from 2000 i'm like really i, I mean it never it, it honestly never did cross my mind and and uh you know once you once you look back at you know right i think i've been riding 13 14 years it, it's really amazing where the time's going i, I mean it, it, it's so true what they say time flies when you're when you're having fun i mean it seems it seems like a few years ago i was just at at the fairgrounds riding, and, and uh, here, here we are 13, 14 years later. You talk about the, re the relationship you've had with your agent. Uh, what is that like as far as do they ever come to you? And I've had people ask me that about other jockeys and agents. Can we say, look, I just can't ride it. I'm not going to ride this horse. Or they say, look, you have to ride this horse. You really, we need to have a relationship with this trainer. How does that give and take work? 
Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I think that's why uh, we work so well is, I mean, I would pretty much get free reign to, uh, to my agent. I mean, I, I, unless he, unless we had two or three horses for a given race, I would give my opinion and say, look, I think this one might be better and this one might not. But I mean, as far as that goes, I would pretty much give him free reign as far as picking horses. And look, you guys, sometimes you're going to pick right. Sometimes you're going to get wrong, but I don't think we've ever had a disagreement. I, I'm not one of them guys to, you know, fire you right away for picking wrong. I mean, that's just how it, in any sport, I mean, that you, you're going to win some and lose some, you know, so I would, I would never get mad at anything like that. And I, I think that's why we work so well, really, for, for so long. And you got a birthday coming up January 12th, I believe. Yeah, I'm a big, 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 uh, big 3-0. It's coming up. Oh, no. Joe Talamo's turning 30. What's happening now? Hey, uh, uh, my, my, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's coming quick. Do you look at guys, though, and you see guys as well? Mike Smith obviously jumps out. Gary Stevens until finally the next surgeries, he couldn't go anymore. And see guys that, you know, have had not just kept riding, but had success in their late 40s and into their 50s. And look and say, I got another 20 good years left because you're in great shape. You always have oh, been. It's, it's absolutely incredible. And especially, you, you know, I was very fortunate when I, when I first came out to California, Mike, uh, uh, actually, Gary Gomez and Mike Smith were, were two guys that I almost kind of mentioned me in a, in a way uh, that I would just kind of follow them around and pick their brain about everything. I mean, I, if I would win win a race, lose a race, I would ask them all the time, man, did, did, did I do this right, do this wrong or whatever? Um, and, and then Mike, I, I, I still to this day ask advice and give advice, but he he was actually one of the, the, the um main people that got, got me involved in working out. Because it, it's funny, when I was in apprentice ride, I never did – you know, you always hear jockeys, you don't want to lift weights and get big and stuff like that. But I, I started working out with Mike and I, I tell you what, that is a testament to why he's, he's able to ride for so long. I mean, he's a, he's in the gym almost every other day. I mean, he, he's on uh, his, his, so they say his body is his temple. I mean, that's so true. He takes care of himself so well. And I'll be honest, if he rides to 60, it, it would, it really would not surprise me at all. It would, it wouldn't. You know, I don't think it'd surprise anyone. He's really an amazing, one of the more amazing athletes in any sport I've covered. No, he, he is. I mean, if you look at any professional athlete, you know, when they say 40 to 45, you start slowing down. I mean, you can make the case for Mike. I mean, in his late 40s, mid 40s, he won some of the biggest races of his career. And before that, he won some big races. So, I mean, it's it's just amazing how he almost every every decade, it's, it's funny to say that, but every decade he almost peaks. We're talking with the talented jockey, Joe Talamo. More with Joe when we come back here on the Horse Racing Show. Stay with us. And welcome back into the Horse Racing Show. I'm Kenny Rice. Thank you for tuning in again. No matter where in the country or world you're listening to us, Joe Talamo is with us, the talented jockey just coming off his 2,000th victory. He has relocated from what had been home base for a long time in Southern California. Now in Arkansas, I imagine you'll be coming to Kentucky after Arkansas and uh, bouncing back and forth uh, during the spring season. Yeah, that's the plan. I'm, uh, that, that's going to be pretty much new home bases. Uh, it's going to be Oakland in the wintertime uh, and then Churchill Downs after that. And then I think uh, Ellis Park in the summertime and then uh, Keeneland, Kentucky Downs. So pre pretty much the Oakland, Kentucky circuit is, is going to uh, gonna be my new home. I have to ask you about what I think is one of the most interesting cultural phenomena in all of sport, and that is the Cajun culture of horse racing and the bush tracks and some of the great jockeys that have come out of there like Eddie De La Husse and Kent DeSormo and Calvin Burrell. We're talking Hall of Famers here. And uh, Joe, uh, what was your experience like on those as a little boy and your dad's a trainer? Oh, it was crazy. I think I rode my first, um, I think I rode my first uh, race at a bush track when I was 14 or 15, I believe. And uh, it was, it was so fun. I mean, there wasn't any chickens or anything like they've had in the, in the past, but uh, it, it was cool. It was actually, it was, it was me, Cody Mesh, Randall Toops, and David Gore. And all four of us ended up turning uh, professional about two years later. And, and quite a few times we all raced together professionally, which I, I mean, I thought, I thought that was pretty cool, you know, to, uh, to have that happen. But it, it was it was cool. I mean, it, it felt it felt to me like I was in the Kentucky Derby doing that. And I mean, it was only, you know, three, four horse fields on a, on a little small uh, track right outside of uh, Lafayette, Louisiana. But I, I'll never forget that. Marie Laveau, that was the name of the first horse I won on. 
that, that was uh, that was pretty special. <laughs> Marie Laveau, also incorporated in a few uh, songs, that name, by the way. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, it, it, it fit pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that culture is is just so different. And in that radius there, I, I think I read one time, I mean, it's only like 20 or 30 miles, all the great jockeys that have come out of there. Uh, did you have a guy that you looked up to or maybe he had popped back to the track later on and see you teenagers that uh, you went, this is uh, this is amazing to see that there oh, is a guy I, from here that's done as well as he's done. Oh, for sure. And I, especially growing up at the uh, at the fairgrounds. I mean, Robbie Alvarado used to be one of my heroes. I, I think I still have about 20 goggles he used to give me when I was 10, 11, or 12. Um, but I, but him, Eddie De La Husi and, and Pat Day, I, I mean, I, I idolized those guys growing up as a kid. And, and, and many others, too. I mean, I, when I was... You know, 11, 12, 13, that's when it, it seemed Jerry Bailey was winning about every state race in the country at the time. Um, and, and Mike Smith at, at the time. I mean, so all of those guys growing up as a kid, I mean, I just completely idolized. And, I mean, I would only dream that I could not even win a race like that, just to be able to ride in a Kentucky Derby or in a grade one race of that statue, just to ride and feel what that would feel like would be, would be uh, tremendous. Do you remember the first time you rode against one of those guys in a big race and – uh, you're in the post parade, and you glance over there, and you go, "Hey, I know that guy. Now I got to beat that guy." Yeah, I, I think it was at the fairgrounds on on uh, Louisiana Derby Day. I was still an apprentice, and uh, God, I I forgot who shipped in, but it, it was uh, it was Robbie Alvarado, Mike Smith shipped in, Gary Gomez. Um, I, I'm trying to think who else. Johnny Velasquez and a couple couple other guys from New York, and I'm like, "Holy cow, what the." <laughs> What the heck is this? This is this is unbelievable. Um, and, and it was it was one of those I can't believe in moments I've I've made it when uh, just like you said, being in a post rate and kind of looking around and, and seeing those guys there. That that was that was pretty special. I imagine there's a few young riders now that come up to Joe Talamo and say, Hey, how do you win two thousand races? How do you win major stakes races like the Santa Anita Derby and Breeders' Cup Turf Sprint? How do you do that, Joe? Do they ask you? You, you know. You know, what's pretty cool is uh, me and Drayden Van Dyke have actually become really, really good friends. He actually, it's funny. My son Vincent, his favorite jockey's Drayden over me. So he, <laughs> he uh, that's how, that's how he he, uh, he comes around all the time. We hang out, but it, it was funny. He he told me one time. He said, "Man, you know, when I was a uh, when I was a little kid growing up in Arkansas, he he actually Facebooked me, but I never I never did look at it at the time. But he he said, man, I used to always dream of, uh, of being a jockey and, and being an apprentice like you. And I, I thought that was pretty cool because I've never really heard that or thought about that before from anyone. So I, I, that, that was pretty cool. It made me feel old, though, so I, I, know, I know how them guys feel now. It goes in a cycle, doesn't it? It goes in a cycle. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you start out, we mentioned Bobby Frankel early, earlier, and uh, you know, one of the all-time great trainers, Hall of Famer, you know, what a legend, and now uh, you know, his protege, Chad Brown's burning it up as a trainer, but the late Bobby Frankel, when you're a kid and you're breaking in and he's giving you advice, did he give you some nugget out there that you still hold on to today? God, it was a, you know one thing about Bobby, he he would uh, he would actually never really tell you too too much, and and actually the horses he put me on they were so good it seemed like he just floated around there and 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 uh, won for fun. But he one thing I remember about him, he was so meticulous about his horse. I mean you could. I, I can remember when I first got to California and I was breezing horses for him. I mean, his uh, his top assistant, uh, Umberto Escano, who was with him, I think, 40-something years. I mean, they would pull out horses. And, I mean, he wasn't he, – He would. I think he was at New York for three months, and it was his first morning there. And he remembered every single horse by name and uh, that they pulled out. I mean, they pulled out, I mean, 15, 20 horses that were going to breeze and gallop. And he would ask them, oh, how's their foot doing? How's this, that? I mean, he hasn't seen them horses in, in three months. And, I mean, I, I just – that blew my mind away. And he, he just – he he knew racing and horses so well. I mean, it, it was – I mean, obviously just a testament to how well he did. Well, that's – it is. And I think, with you know, same with you. Same with all the good jockeys. You know, you still remember it, that horse maybe that you rode against that maybe you're either going to ride now or you're going to ride against him once again and uh, his nuances and what could happen during the race. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. And, and especially, I mean, for anyone in this game, it's all about, it's all about the opportunities, you know, and, and that's another big reason why, why I moved from uh, California. I mean, as much as I love it there, I definitely thought that, you know, Oakland and then in Kentucky, we could get some, get some more opportunities and, uh, and, and it looks great so far. 
my uh, new agent, Jake Romans, uh, we, we talked this morning. It, lo- it looks like I'm going to have quite a, quite a bit of business. So I, I think it's, it's going to be a real fun meet. Joe Talamo, the jockey, has won 2,000 races, one of the truly good guys in the sport, uh, Eclipse Award winner, relocating, as he said now, to the Arkansas-Kentucky circuit in his career. Uh, I don't know if this is exciting as being on the Conan O'Brien show, but I'm glad that you're with us. Oh, you're my man. I, I, you know what? One of my early memories as far as watching big races, uh, you and King Goldberg, I think, used to do all the uh, – was it, with it, with it on like NBC or ESPN? I, I forgot which station. Yeah, was, ESPN I, back in those days. See, now that now oh, I feel old. See, I remember see, I remember I, meeting you when you were that teenager just coming up. Oh, gosh. I, could, I think I was 10, 11, or 12. I mean, for all the big races, I can remember me and my dad sitting there watching them, whether it was on uh, Kentucky Derby or, or – um, Kentucky Derby or Breeders' Cups. I'll never forget. You guys would always have your picks, and I can always remember, man, I hope they interview me one day. And here here I am, you're interviewing me, so <laughs> I, I think I made it. <laughs> you, you have, and you have made it big. I remember you on the O'Brien show. I thought, hey, look, there's Joe on the O'Brien show. See, I got excited about that. I And I'm going to tell you, that it's a funny story about that, too. I I, uh, I always love doing interviews and give, giving my time for anyone, but that was one of the, the one times I was, I, I don't know why I got so nervous and freaked out because, uh, right before, right before I went out, the, um, the producer, whoever that sent you out, he's like, okay, don't mess this up, kid. Um, <laughs> you're about to be in front of national television. And he was just kidding around, but I'm like, Oh my God. I mean, I almost got into a panic attack. <laughs> and I, I sure hope I don't mess this up in front of everybody. But, uh, but that, that was cool, man. What it, what an experience that was. That, that was, that was pretty funny. See, you can always tell them, Hey, you hop on an 1100 pound horse going 35 miles an hour. And the nearest guy's like doing the same thing. And he's six inches away from you. Tell me how nervous you'd I be. Should, I, I should have. Yeah. I, I should have came back with him with that. <laughs> oh, Joe, listen, it's always great to catch up with you. And uh, best wishes in Arkansas and uh, Vincent and Dominic, I believe, right? That the boys? Yes, sir. That's them. Three, three and one and a half. And, boy, they, uh, besides going to the gym, they, they keep me and my wife busy running around. She, I'd say. She's a saint. I, don't, I, don't, I don't know how she chases them all day. I really don't. <laughs> and, and then at night, you get your own workout after you've ridden all day. See, you got to chase oh, those yeah. boys around. Oh yeah, they, they're I tell you what, they they have racetrack in their blood. They're up at four four thirty five every morning. They, <laughs> it's it's crazy. They they uh, I, I I know they'll have a good work ethic. Oh man, that's great, Joe. Always a pleasure, and we'll catch up again soon. I hope, and uh, all the best to you. Thanks so much for having me on, Kenny. I appreciate it. Joe Talamo, the very talented jockey, joining us here on the Horse Racing Show. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Horse Racing Show. I'm Kenny Rice. Earlier, we had talked about the importance, not just in horse racing, but all of sports, to have corporate sponsorship. Uh, It's been coming about for the last 25 years. It continues on. There's very few events out there that doesn't have some kind of corporate tie-in. And among them in horse racing, the Breeders' Cup. All the races are sponsored. There is a company that is based in Lexington, Kentucky, that is an international company. And it's called Big Ass Fans. And this past year, they got involved with the Breeders' Cup. They're actually the sponsor of the Dirt Mile. And with me is the CEO of Big Ass Fans, Lenny Rhodes. Lenny, welcome to the Horse Racing Show. Hi, Kenny. Thank you. So how does, it seems like a natural, you being based in Lexington in horse country, but until recent uh, year or so, I don't really remember Big Ass being involved with the horse racing business. No, you're, you're absolutely right. If you go back, this is our 20th year anniversary. The company actually got its roots in agricultural, equine, livestock is where some of the first fan applications went. So, so cooling animals, there, there's very uh, well-documented science on the benefits of that. Many of the horse farms here in Lexington and around the world have our fans. Uh, you'll, you'll see them in breeding sheds. You'll see them in stalls. So it's a very good market for us, and, and the fact that it's right here in our backyard um, makes it very easy. The, the, the folks at Breeders reached out to us. Um, I personally grew up around the, uh, the bottom echelon of the thoroughbred industry. I lived uh, right behind a little racetrack outside Columbus called Beulah Park that's long gone. So I was an easy sell. Um, and, and so my marketing people came in with a, uh, a pitch to get involved in, in a more serious way. 
um, and, and I was very amenable to it. And, and I have to tell you, the response that we've gotten from the industry, the, the breeders folks, um, the participants has been fantastic. So, so, so far for us, um, I have nothing, nothing but good things to say about our involvement. Lenny, I imagine too, like with horse racing, as you know, as they know, uh, it's crucial to have corporate sponsorship. And I know you do some other sports as well, and it's crucial probably for them to have corporate sponsorship. I, I think you're right. And, and we have a lot of people approach us looking for sponsorship. And I, I would say, and, and probably uh, understate it, but we are highly, highly, highly selective, right? And, and there are many, many applications. Yeah, you know, we've been approached by NASCAR. We get approached by you know, the NFL and, and our product, really, we, we are a sort of a niche product, very industrial, commercial work focused. And, and so the equine focus for us and, and the traction that we've got in there with a relative, a relevant, excuse me, a relevant marketplace is, is very unique for us. And, and so sponsoring Breeders' Cup for us uh, has made much, much more sense than, than virtually any of the other opportunities that have come across my desk. You know, people have asked me, not just specifically about big-ass fans, but about any corporate tie-in with the Breeders' Cup race, especially a million-dollar race. You guys put up the whole million dollars, just like somebody sponsors a $2 million, they put up the whole $2 million. How does that work? So we, we don't put up the entire purse, but but a substantial portion of that. We, we, we don't fully disclose for our contract with the, the folks at Breeders sort of the, the details of the contract. Um, but, but we're very proud to sponsor – the, the race. We're talking with Lenny Rhodes. He's the CEO of a company called Big Ass Fans, which is an international company. And as the company uh, name would imply, they have these huge fans that I've taken advantage of a few times as well. Uh, last uh, year, I was doing the World Equestrian Games in Tryon, North Carolina. It was brutally hot and humid in the summer. And uh, you guys had a fan just inside uh, one of the venues there. And then you had some at the Breeders' Cup out in Santa Anita. And I believe, too, now there's cool-down areas as part of the kind of the new thing with you uh, that racetracks and equine facilities are going to use more of for their fans as well as for the athletes? Absolutely. And so one of the things that, that we found, and, if, if, you know, you saw in Santa Anita this year, we have portable fans. So, so you know, our bread-and-butter fans are the large 24-foot gigantic overhead fans. We also have portable 6- and 8-foot fans. One of the things that's unique about our fans, they're very quiet. You know, so y'all think about sort of uh, the, the uh, you know, fans we grew up with, very noisy, you can't stand. We could conduct this interview in front of a big-ass fan, and, and a number of them went on. And so that's one of the things that, that we've done to let people experience the fan. We say once you've, you've been under a fan, once you've been in front of a, a big-ass fan, you really find out it's unique, and, and, and people really like it. And, and so those cool-down areas are a nice way for us to sort of give back to the customers, potential customers, and, and to the racetracks that we partner with. And with that said, Lenny, uh, obviously the Breeders' Cup's happy to have you in with their organization. And obviously, if you said you're happy to be in with the organization, do you get feedback from some other people that have little, if anything, to do with the horse racing business, but maybe stood in front of one of your fans at Santa Anita or thought, if nothing else, the name was so unique they wanted to find out more and they got in contact with you based on horse racing sponsorship? Absolutely. And, and, you know, Santa Anita being most recent, you know, we, we had a booth there. We had a cool down station there. We had a number of folks, both on a personal level and, and on a, their business level that, that were there participating in the event that, that came back and looked for information on putting in fans in their particular applications. Oftentimes, you know, aviation is a big market for us. So, you know, private aviation, airport hangars, things of that nature, airport terminals. Uh, we had a number of inquiries around there. Personal barns, a, a number of applications there, some some interest there, but but we've definitely found good synergy with with the uh, the patrons of the various horse races. And probably most important is anyone said Lenny Rhodes, I want you to invest in a horse. Uh, <laughs> for better or worse, I, I do own a, a little piece of a, a partnership horse that I'm glad to say last Friday he managed to get third place, which for us, we were thrilled. <laughs> That's money. Stock not turned into a Canadian sushi. So he's, he's, a, he's a real horse race now, even if it was the first race at Turfway Park. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I say, any time you get a little bit back, uh, I know this the hard way, uh, having 
went into a venture once and got 10 cents back on my dollar, and I was thrilled that I got even 10 cents back. It had been so long. Uh, what I have done is I've adopted Spun to Run, who's the horse that runs the, the uh, dirt mile for us, and he was just announced that he's going to be in the Pegasus World Cup. So I'm going to be uh, – betting a little bit of money there it'll be a much cheaper way to invest in a horse so he's been good to me after the win <laughs> okay uh as far as let's go back to beulah park which has never been mentioned in 50 prior episodes of the horse racing show but lenny rhodes the ceo of big ass fans obviously grew up and knows beulah park and few people remember that quaint little racetrack that in ohio that i, I thought was a, you know a little gem i like those kind of tracks it, you know, it, it was it was interesting, and so you know, my family was tangentially involved in horses. You had some some riding horses, lived out in the country, um, but but grew up around racing. You know, in a very minor way. My wife and I have been big Derby fans. You know, we we've watched it for years. Um, you know, and and so you know, my wife and I are high school sweethearts, and you know, we used to sneak away and go to Beulah and watch the ponies race. So so it's always been a part of our life, and, and one that we fondly look back on. And, and, and frankly, sad the track is gone. It's uh, sort of a, a bygone era. I always liken it to maybe somebody has a fond memory of a 3A football game, a yeah, 3A a football bit. team, you know, and and then one day you go to Ohio State Stadium. Uh, you know, it's a different world, obviously a much bigger atmosphere, but yet you still remember that small uh, stadium somewhere that uh, you had great moments with, great memories with. I, I was, it's, it's a perfect analogy because, you know, I, I took my wife with me to uh, Santa Anita for Breeders' Cup this past year. And, you know, of course, being right here in Lexington, you know, we, we go to Keeneland quite a bit. And, and Keeneland's beautiful and we love it, but but it's not giant, right? And, and so, right. you know, we, we walked into Santa Anita and she was like, my God. I'm like, yeah, there's a lot of people that can come watch races here. It was probably 10 Beulah Parks. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, you could you could fit Beulah and Ellis and River Downs and many we could mention into that place. You know, Arapaho, if anybody was ever out in the Denver area remembers that. Um, Oh, my goodness. And, you know, what a backdrop, too. I mean, you know, you could do your commercials out there with the San Gabriel Mountains and the palm trees. I, I think Santa Anita just has a unique experience for people. One of the most beautiful places on earth. I the, can't think of a better place to go watch a race. With all due respect to my good friends at Keeneland. <laughs> yeah. Well, Lenny Rhodes, CEO of Big Ass Fans, is with us. It's an international company. They got involved in horse racing in the last year, sponsored the Dirt Mile at the Breeders' Cup. And, Lenny, as uh, we were speaking earlier in this show before we got everything started with you, if you don't have corporate sponsorship these days, I really don't know how many sports can exist. Do you? I really don't. I mean, it, it's at every level to be competitive. It, it's gotten expensive, right? And, and you know, we're, we're all fighting for eyeballs and, and things of that nature. And, and so – relevant ways to, to make it interesting. And, and I know the Breeders' Cup people were, were careful about who they pick and who they sponsor, who they uh, partner with. And they, they treated us very well. They're, they're not indiscriminate, right? And so while the temptation to go chase those dollars, I, I think they've done a good job of being disciplined. You know, one of the things our partnership with, with Breeders has led to, we, we signed a deal with the NTRA today. And, and so, you know, we, we see sort of these affiliate things, people that care about the industry um, you know, and, and certainly we care about it. We participate in it. Um, you know, we, we provide valuable service to our customers, but, but we care about horse racing, you know, in, in a way that, that other people might care about other sort of big corporate events. But, you know, we want to see horse racing continue to thrive and, 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 you know, grow. It's going through some difficult times right now. There, there's no secret about that. Um, we got a lot of questions about, you know, why'd you guys get in right now? Right. There, there's a lot of, uh, less than positive press out there. But, but we think that, that horse racing is good for horses, right? It, it, it's a very good thing, contrary to some of the negative press. The, these owners and, and farms and, and racetracks take good care of them, it employs a lot of people. Um, it, and so we think that's an important one, and, and we're glad to participate, and, and we look forward to actually growing our participation in, in other ways, as, as the NTRA deal I mentioned sort of uh, exemplifies. Lenny, I appreciate your time, and uh, we'll probably talk a little bit down the road as we get ready for the Keeneland Breeders' Cup coming up and the continued success. And maybe maybe we'll find an old Beulah Park picture and bring you into the studio one day, reminisce. I, 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 I'll, I'll scour my files and see what I can find, Kenny, but I would love that. <laughs> All right, sounds great. Thank you. Lenny Rhodes, CEO of Big Ass Fans, one of the sponsors this year of the Breeders' Cup. What's ahead for the Derby picture in 2020? 
We'll talk more about that and take a look at some of the contenders. Is it too early to talk about it? Nah, never. It's derby time, always. More on the horse racing show right after this. Welcome back to the Horse Racing Show. I'm Kenny Rice. Thank you for being with us again this week. 93.9 The Ville in Louisville, WVLK in Lexington. If you're listening to us on Google Play or iTunes, on Stitcher, iHeartRadio, or watching us right now on YouTube, we appreciate it very much. Getting ready for the Kentucky Derby. What? That's like May 2nd. That's like years from now, it would seem. But of course, the Derby picture actually starts in, you know when it starts? Does anybody know? Anybody know? September 14th, the Iroquois Stakes at Churchill Downs. That was the start of 19 races for two-year-olds, now obviously turning three. And these races run all the way for about another month into February. And that is called the prep season. There's points that are put on each race, which is usually 10 points. You had 20 points on the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. Some might be surprised that that's not worth more. And then we will shift into the 16-race championship season, and that's where we go into double jeopardy, where you can really accumulate the points. Because then you get into races where they have 50 points, or the big races like Arkansas Derby, Florida Derby, Santa Anita Derby, uh, Louisiana Derby, Wood Memorial, Bluegrass Stakes, where it's 100 points if you win. That adds up quickly, obviously. And that's been the system now going on about eight years at Churchill Downs, Used to, it was based on money earnings, which was a little skewed because they had some races that got up to seven figures for two-year-olds. Not necessarily the better two-year-olds, but they won a big race. So they were getting in the derby. This does not eliminate the fact that some horses still get into the 20-horse derby field or 18, 19, usually 20. They don't belong. But more favorites have been winning in this period than ever before since they went to the point system. Basically, it's like seeding for the NCAA tournament. You're getting your one, your two, and your three seeds that are accumulating the most points because they're pointing to these big races where there's more competition, tougher competition. Yeah, well, when it's all said and done, I mean, it's basically a merit system, right? That is it. And it's worked well. And there was uh, some skeptics earlier, well, what about money? It's all about money. And it usually is about money. When they say it's never about money, it's about money. Isn't that right, Scott Hall? Yes, indeed. You know, always about money. It's always about money. But in this case, it actually has become now always about points, and it's worked well. Uh, what is really interesting coming into this year's Derby is that, uh, well, Thomas Kenny, you're going to tell us right now, the nominees for the three finalists for the Eclipse Award for the two-year-olds of last year are... Got uh, Maxfield. Yeah. Whose injury kept him out of the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. Stormed the court. Who won the Breeders' Cup Juvenile as a long shot. And structure. And structure. So, you know, you have horses that are in this that normally would be like, that's the horse. Remember a couple of years ago, game winner won at Churchill Downs, the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. That was the horse. That was the horse we all talked about. But things have changed with this year being a very unpredictable season. Maxfield got injured. Dennis's moment stumbled out of the gate, never got his chance. Maybe some thought he could be a finalist or should be a finalist for a uh, two-year-old of the year and then stormed the court a long shot. So now it's made for a very interesting derby picture. You talk about the derby because that's what everybody wants to win. Chad Brown is one of the three nominees this year for trainer of the year for 2019. He will probably win it. Uh, I would say that he would love to get him a Kentucky Derby victory. And in time, he probably will. He's already won the Preakness uh, one time. But here's a horse to talk about right now. This moment. It's a horse named Authentic. It's a good name, Authentic. He won easily, impressively the Sham Stakes just a few days ago at Santa Anita. He happens to be trained by a guy named Bob Baffert, who's done well in the Kentucky Derbies. He's won five of them. And, of course, two triple crowns. This was only his second start, and now the plan is to put him in the San Felipe in March at Santa Anita. In all likelihood, Authentic will stay on the West Coast. Baffert has other horses, it depends, and uh, probably run the Santa Anita Derby, although they might ship him like to Arkansas for the Arkansas Derby. 100-point races. Uh, that is the road that he will probably take. 
So you can start following some of your favorite horses. There's a horse named Independence Hall that had a nice win last year as a two-year-old at Aqueduct, had a more impressive win New Year's Day in the Jerome Stakes at Aqueduct. And that's another horse that's popped up on the radar. And that's the great thing at this time of the year about the Kentucky Derby because everybody wants to win the Derby. Another thing that's great about this point system is that if you assign some of these bigger races, like the Arkansas Derby, for example, the big, you know, 100 points, that gets people from all over the place to come and compete head-to-head. And that's the that's what they wanted. You know, they wanted to have a process of elimination where they had some of the one seeds and three seeds and four seeds going against each other. And that's probably good even for some of the owners uh, maybe hard for them to take it sometimes. It, it, my horse really wasn't quite that good. Uh, again, when you come to the Derby, you probably got six horses maybe that could win it. That leaves like 14 and probably four or five that don't have a chance. That doesn't eliminate that, but I think the point system has been very good as far as narrowing it down, who to keep an eye on and who you might want to uh, – who you, who you might want to bet on, because that's been the pick of the favorites. So that's the Kentucky Derby. We'll keep closer eyes. We move closer to the Derby, because it'll come just like that. You know that. Before we know it, it'll be May 2nd. Okay. More on the... Right, Scott? It's right there. That's right. We'll be yeah. in a shorts and t-shirt. Yeah, shorts and t-shirt weather coming. More coming up on the Horse Racing Show right after this. And welcome back into the Horse Racing Show. A few precious minutes to wrap up Episode 51. Thank you for tuning in. Thanks to Jockey Joe Talamo. I always enjoy talking with him. You know, he's making a bold move from Southern Cal to the Midwest, and then uh, I know he'll do well. He's just too talented a rider. And then also thanks to Lenny Rhodes, the CEO with the Big Ass Fans Company, and the importance of corporate sponsorship in racing. You know, what's really interesting about this year, guys, and I'm talking to you, Thomas, and Ben, and you in there, Scott, you know, no triple crown winner of a race, no triple crown winner of any race this year is among the three-year-old champion nominees in the Eclipse Awards. And who are they, Thomas? Bricks and mortar? No, three-year-olds. Oh, three-year-olds. Yeah, the three-year-olds. Sorry. Maximum security? Yeah. Code of honor? Yeah. In Omaha Beach. In Omaha Beach, coming off a big late win in the season. You know, what's interesting is he didn't even run in the Triple Crown races, any of them, because he got injured before the Derby. Now, maximum security, I know, finished first in the Derby, but did not win the Derby. In the record books, it will show the first, and let's hope only, on-track disqualification happened this past year. So he didn't win the Derby. But he did go on to win the high school. He won the Cigar Mile. He certainly had, I think, the best three-year-old season. I don't know if that says a lot for him or for the three-year-olds in general. Code of Honor had moments. He came on late in the season. Of course, he did run in the Triple Crown. Uh, He did well in the Kentucky Derby. And then he came on and won the Travers, won by a DQ in the Jockey Club. So, you know, that that helped his standing. Uh, But it wasn't that year. You know, you look back on all those horses, and usually you have – You know, a three-year-old that you can still get excited about or ran in the Breeders' Cup. Yeah, there's usually a standout. And and only in Code of Honor ran in the Breeders' Cup. Mm -hmm. You know, he made it to the Breeders' Cup out of that group. I know there were some others, but of of kind of the standouts. You know, I kind of looked at War of Will a little, you know, I kind of have a place for him a little bit because he ran in all three Triple Crown races and won the Preakness. But this year, you've got Country House that moved up to win the Derby, a long shot. I don't know what we're going to hear from him, if anything, again. It'll be curious how maximum security goes on with the four-year-old season. I'd like to have seen him run in some of the more classic races, the ones better known to the general public. He didn't have to. He's not only up for three-year-old of the year, he's up for horse of the year as well, which I think, as you said, bricks and mortar is going to win. Yes. But that is for another day in time. So thank you for being with us. Thanks, Scott Hall. Thanks, Ben Chaffins. Thanks, Mr. Thomas Kenny. And thank you. I'm Kenny Rice, and we'll talk again next week on the Horse Racing Show. <laughs>